So, hi, <laughs> I'm sitting with Jesse Goodman from Stackmob, and it turns out Jesse in his former life was a patent lawyer. So, uh, I'm going to ask him a couple of questions about patents, general, uh, patents in general in the United States, and maybe he's got some interesting views on the, the good or bad sides uh, of software patents, something that uh, generally very few people can break down to the level that we engineers can actually understand. Maybe there's some, something good, or maybe there's there's some something bad about that. So, hi Jesse, thanks. Hi, hi Oliver, thanks. Thanks a lot. for volunteering. Sure. To, to this uh, to do this grilling. <laughs> can can you give us a little bit of background? Sure. So my name is Jesse. Um, I grew up on the East Coast of the U.S. Uh, I moved out here to California to the Bay Area to go to law school initially. Mm -hmm. Stayed out here for a few years and have been here ever since. Um, before I came to Stack Mob, I came to Stack Mob in Dece about December of last year. Before that, I spent about three years doing patent litigation. I, I was working as a lawyer at Covington and Berlin, mostly focusing on patent litigation. So I worked on a few cases there. And so patent lit litigation meant that somebody was uh, suing somebody else over some patents being infringed. Exactly. Or whether or not the patents are valid is the other <laughs> main issue usually. But usually involved in infringement. Mm -hmm. so um, you, sure. And on. then after Covington, I moved on here to Staff Mob where I am operations manager. Right? Operations manager. So you manage operations. But yesterday you told me you also do insurance and finances and yep. all, so all these I things. So I do insurance, I do the finance stuff, and sort of HR here at the company as well. So sort of wear a different hat. Anything that nobody else wants to deal with is my So part. anything that's not engineer, you do? Basically everything that's not involving making or selling the product is mine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, can you say what prompted this move from being a lawyer to something startup? Like uh, sure, Stackhop. Isn't uh, that like the <laughs> move, move downwards the ca career ladder? Mm, I don't know which way it is up or down, but I t I take it as an up because I'm a lot happier. Uh -huh. um, so basically, uh, as a, working in a big law firm, you have very very little control over your schedule or your lifestyle, and that's something free time is something that I like to have, mm. and that's something that I couldn't ever guarantee in my last job. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing that prompted the move. The other thing is, as a litigator, you know, you're suing people or being sued by people all the time, mm -hmm. and that means a lot of fighting. Okay. And I only like to fight with my friends. Fighting is bad. Fighting is bad for me all, if I do it all the time. And, I prefer and to. probably also if it's for money, you get paid for fighting. You get paid for fighting. Because if you fight because you, you are conv con uh, convinced of something or have an opinion that, that you uh, want to uh, kind of... How do you say? Defend. Mm -hmm. It's different than when you get paid for actually taking somebody's uh, case and defending him, even though you might not think he's in the right. Well, I mean, it's not even a matter of who's in the right and who's in the wrong a lot of the time. It's just a matter of think about what you're actually fighting over. I mean, it's not about the stuff that you see on TV. It's usually about you literally might have three weeks of fighting over what day on which to hold a deposition. Mm -hmm. Or you might fight for three weeks over whether or not to produce a certain piece of paper to the other side. So and then you might fight over how it's been redacted and if it's overly redacted. And then you might fight about if uh, you should be punished for over-redacting in the first place. And then you might also fight about the entire history of letters that went back and forth during this fight. Mm -hmm. So... So is it, it like is it like there was a, a, a report? Uh, Apple and Samsung are, are fighting mm -hmm. uh, all the time, and there was one one such fight being uh, uh, pub published or kind of brought to, to public where Samsung complained that Apple didn't didn't give them certain documents, so they weren't able to use them yep. in their defense or whatever. Yeah, I mean that's actually something that comes up in a lot of cases. It's not unique. To or to Samsung. Um, and just to be clear, before we go any further, I used to represent Samsung, so oh. there's only so much I can say about certain issues, but I did not work on well, the Apple-Samsung case. Yeah. Um, right now, in this world now, back in the old days when you sued somebody, the universe of documents that were relevant to a case was pretty small. I mean, yeah. it was physical paper. It was stuff that you could find. Um, and there's only so much paper that anyone really would have. When you get into the more modern world, when everyone is just using email and storing information on databases or hosted services, then the volume of paper, of electronic paper that exists, is so huge that it becomes almost impossible for a human to even look at it. So we to call it electronically stored information, which is nothing. It's a fancy name for the obvious. Um, but because there's just that much data out there, 
it's very hard to collect all that data. It's very hard for lawyers to look through that data to figure out what's privileged and what, what is, for example, like an email between a client and his or her attorney um, versus stuff that's totally relevant to the lawsuit and should be turned over and stuff that really nobody cares about. It's people's personal and you know, could have nothing to do with anything. So when you start putting to, putting those things together, having a gigantic case, a lot of money at stake, with enormous universe of documents, it becomes pretty easy for you to forget to turn something over or decide something relevant is irrelevant or just for things mistakes to happen you not to turn over documents. Mm. So it's it's not not just kind of fighting over whether whether somebody's right or wrong, but like it You're sounds like how you get there. Ninety ninety percent seems to be administrative fighting. When, what, where, who, in what order, um, should we, should we not? There's a lot of that. Uh, you know, I can't give you an exact percentage of what fighting is meaningful and what's not meaningful, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of it is fighting over procedure rather mm -hmm. than the substance of mm -hmm. it. Well, this, this, this situation, would you call that broken? Or would you call that a, a symptom of that the, the whole process, there's something wrong, that it, it actually furthers... You know, a, a lot of people have been talking, you know, we've talked a lot about just problems and just, we call it discovery and, and finding out what's going on the other side and turning over documents to each other. Um, one of the big trends in discovery now and something that I think could repair, no, I don't know repair, but could ameliorate the situation is that a lot of judges are using more technology now and encouraging parties to use more technology to reduce this problem mm -hmm. uh, because I do think that to a certain extent it is broken. We have a system that's designed for an older time um, with different technologies. Some of the new new solutions that judges and uh, lawyers have come up with and others have come up with um, are to increasing use of computers and intelligence searching across uh, databases and data to let computers have more of a role in sorting out what's relevant to a case and what is not relevant to a case mm -hmm. through things like predictive coding or uh, sampling of data and seeing if the computer is right and then iterating upon that and telling the computer what's wrong and training the computer essentially to do more and more and more. Mm -hmm. So I think that as time goes on, you're going to see more and more of this trend taking hold mm -hmm. and courts seem to start have started embracing it in the past they were talking to. Okay. That's an interesting insider view, but uh, okay, it, it's it's a uh, a reason why we engineer would never want to be a patent lawyer <laughs> because that sounds really boring. But so what we are actually interested in is uh, how uh, patents are relevant for for software. Can you maybe give us in two or three sentences or in your own words? Why do we need patents? Sure. Is there some good reason to have patents? You know, there's some good and some bad reasons. But the good reason is, is a patent is a way of encouraging people to make up an invention and give it to the world rather than keeping it secret. Mm -hmm. The whole purpose, the whole plan is, is that you come up with your own great idea, you bring it, you develop it, um, and then you tell people about it. So other people can eventually use that invention too and benefit from it and build on it and make their own stuff based on that. Um, you know, the alternative to a patent is to have something as a trade secret. Um, I could just make sure that nobody ever knows how to do what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of taking something away from the world that they might want to have. Mm -hmm. um, that's sort of the good part about patents. There's plenty of stuff that's just messy. Well, that, that's one of the, the reasons that's often quoted. But the question is, uh, that now there are so many patents, and many patents are so broad, that isn't that then actually the same uh, you have a big pile of, of ideas mm -hmm. and nobody's ever going to sift through these in search of we, like there, there was this, this, this funny statement uh, somebody said uh, we are out of ideas let's go search some patents <laughs> <laughs> so you, you would usually not do that and there are actually lawyers who recommend to people to not search because if you can prove that they searched then then you have an obligation to disclose anything that you found that's similar to your yeah patent. Um, there is just there is there are way too many patents out there. I think everybody knows there are way, way, way too many patents, and that really causes exactly the problem that you're talking about. It's impossible to know what's in the universe of patents. At any given moment, somebody is probably infringing somebody's patent for who knows what reason, yeah. and it'll be very difficult to ever know if that's that for that person to ever even figure that out. There have been. But isn't it 
that, that companies are amassing patents uh, actually for defense mostly of because course. if there's a, a company like Apple who has products yep. and these products probably infringe on some other uh, yep. companies' pro uh, products. Now this other company has products that infringe on Apple's patents so they can, can get together and say, okay, I, I, I have these three, you have these five, okay, let's transfer a little bit of money and then we both, both are happy. Uh, it depends if patent litigation is very common. Um, basically what happens in, in most patent suits, as long, as long as there are two parties, both of which hold patents, and both of them make products, you know, you know I'm leaving out the trolls here, uh, as soon as one company threatens to sue the other for patent infringement, the other will immediately counterclaim using their own patent portfolio and sue them for patent infringement. And the basic idea behind it is just mutually assured destruction. Okay. Um, so the name of the game is to try to scare everyone out of suing you in the first place, because nobody really wants to have these battles. Uh, now, you mentioned patent trolls. Isn't that, that is the big problem nowadays, that you have companies that don't have products, mm -hmm. so you cannot counter sue them for some infringement, Yeah. Uh, and then they have a, a, a monetary incentive to go find people to sue, basically. Absolutely. I mean, they do... That's, It's not that they have a monetary incentive to find people to sue. That is their entire business. Yes. That is their entire business model. That is the only way they make money is by suing and forcing people, threatening people into taking licenses. Now, you know, troll is a loaded term because it can mean a lot of things. You know, you know the, the trolls themselves like the term non-practicing entity. Non-practicing entity. That's what they like. Um, but, you know, <laughs> the, the, the troll sort of spam the spectrum. Um, some of them are exactly what you expect. There are these holding companies you know, bought with the, you know, funded by investor money that amass a patent portfolio and sue people based on the patents. Um, others are things like universities that don't really practice their patents, but they are actually doing original research and making new inventions, mm -hmm. even if they're not necessarily monetizing them or bringing them to market. Um, and then you actually have, you know, the sort of middle category, which are the lone inventors, like those few guys that are still out there, that are actually inventing their own patents, uh, you know, inventing their own invention, they still own their own patents, they were not assigned to some company they work for, and they're suing because, you know, not because they're necessarily making the product, but they think, this was my idea in the first place, and I should get a little bit of credit for it. Now, wh where's the distinction? Because I thought um, patents uh, were meant that there's, there's something that a great deal of effort went into, and you want uh, to get exclusivity for disclosing this. Mm -hmm. But uh, lately, as it is with software and business processes, uh, you, you can have an idea that literally takes you like 15 minutes, you do a patent search, don't find anything that's really close to that, yep. put in some, some legalese because there's some, some special way to describe this idea that you had, and then you file a patent. Yep. So there's, I, I didn't really invest any kind of effort in that. Still, uh, I, I then own the idea, and other people who are spending lots of effort uh, are infringing on, on me, so it's, isn't that kind of unfair? Wouldn't there have to be a drawn a line? Okay, you, you, you didn't exert yourself in any way coming up with this pattern, so you're not allowed to have this, and this other guy was working on it for 10 years, so he is allowed. Some people have a flash of inspiration and genius, and some people get there through really hard work, and some people get there through both ways, and I don't really know any way that you can sort of make a system that you can tell those apart without sort of looking like at somebody's Could, could you mind. tie it maybe to a product that you have to show that your invention is used in a product that, that you uh, make or license or... So in order to get a patent in the US, you need to show, you have to be able to show two things. One is that you've conceived of a patentable idea, like you've come up with a notion in your head, and that's sort of like an internal thing. And the other is that you've reduced the invention to practice, meaning it works. Like you've made a prototype, like it works, you've tried it. That said, another way to reduce something to practice is to submit a patent application for it, and that's considered reducing something to practice itself. But isn't that like the, the cat biting its own tail? <laughs> uh, because uh, I, I have a concrete example. One of my former employers uh, is, is paying the employees $1,000 for each patentable idea, yep. and if the uh, patent gets granted, they get another $1,000 mm -hmm. if, if they're still with the company. And it's, it's literally just just ideas, mm -hmm. nothing ever built, yeah. uh, just to, to file a patent. So it, how, how, how 
how does this work? You get a big pile of broad ideas. Mm -hmm. You can claim, okay, they are, they are how do you say, reduced to practice? Reduced to practice. Reduction to practice. Yeah. Reduced to practice because they are filed, and that's it. And people start suing each other over something they think they came, came up with first. People sue each other for anything. You can always sue somebody for something. doesn't mean you can win. That's the second part of it, is that there is a huge glut of patents. There's a gigantic universe of patents, some of which are for crazy things, or some of which are duplicative, some of which are just all over the map. Um, in order to sue somebody else successfully and collect money from them for infringement, you, know what? you can't just show that you have a patent. You have to show that it's a valid patent. And there are certain rules for what makes a patent valid and what's not. So you could have a patent that is granted, but still you have to defend its validity when, when you sue somebody. I think that maybe around half of patents are invalid, really, if you look at them. Good. But, you know, they just don't know that at the moment of grant. Um, so, you know, the main arguments when you're trying to show that a patent is invalid and can't be used to sue somebody for infringement are that, essentially, it boils down to somebody else really came up with this first, or what you're saying in this patent is so obvious that we're not letting you get away with it. So the first one is called prior art. The first one is called anticipation, but you use prior art to show it. So the, the, essentially, if somebody else came up with it first, it's anticipated. Somebody else anticipated your thought first. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be like you found it in a, there's literally another, there's an older patent saying the same thing that you're saying. That's one way of showing it. Or I actually saw this machine. There's pictures of this machine that's identical to the machine you're trying to patent, and I found it in Philadelphia in the 1970s, and here's an old photograph of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's anticipation. Obviousness is something like, I invent a coffee mug for the very first time. Uh, nobody else has invented it before. It's totally unanticipated. You know, my patent expires, and 20 years later, somebody says, I, my invention is to make this coffee mug except with this handle on the other side. A left-handed coffee mug. A left-handed coffee mug. Yeah. Now, that's something that we might probably just call obvious, because it doesn't take one of ordinary skill in the art, one who just knows coffee mugs and the technology of coffee mugs, it'd be pretty obvious to that person. Mm -hmm. So those are the two main ways that you sort of eventually put some um, restraints on what patents are enforceable. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're basically saying uh, getting a patent granted doesn't automatically give you the right or the, the ability to uh, charge money for it or, or sue, money, sue for money because it could still be, like you said, something like 50% likelihood that it's not even valid. Sure. So, I mean, it's a lot of, it's one, it's one thing to get the patent, it's another to actually be able to enforce the patent. Mm. Um, there's all sorts of patents that are granted that are not enforced, mm. or enforceable. Aren't then even the, the people who, who are getting uh, patents granted being cheated by the uh, US Patent Office? Because uh, if I'm getting a, a grant for a, a patent, a, a patent granted, uh, I would assume, well, now it's, it's, it's worth something. So they're basically get, getting fees, like I think seven thousand dollars or something, for for uh, getting getting the patent. But then you, you actually don't have anything. Well, I mean, the solution you have a couple of solutions to that. One is if you don't really want a patent, just don't file. If you don't want to pay the fees, don't file for a patent. That's one possibility. The other is just sort of recognizing that what really is the patent office supposed to do? I mean. The problem is, is and it goes back to some other one that we were just talking about before, is that the universe of data is just way too big for any person or group of people to search all of it. Mm -hmm. So um, it wouldn't really be fair to say that here's a patent and it is valid for all time, when then somebody later just says, actually somebody else invented this first. They both can't, they both, they can't both own this invention, right? Mm -hmm. So should we just, you know, should the, the, the the guy that just came in the door trumped the older guy. Like, I'm not sure why that's fair to either of them. So, there's certain parts of the system that are really going to be hard to fix. Mm -hmm. One possible way of doing it is opening up patent examination. You know, the process by which the PTO looks at the at the application and decides if it actually is patentable. Um, opening it up so that third parties can participate. In it. Uh, so like, so like IBM like they go and uh, crowdsource it. Sure. So like, like we have these patents. Whole world have a look if if you think that this is valid. Sure. I mean, and certain companies set up systems that are almost like that. They set up their own like, alternative patent universe. Um, IBM, for example, has been known to encourage people to submit not really patent applications, but it's essentially what you put into a patent application. 
and IBM will publish it, and that will guarantee that in the future nobody else can ever patent that stuff because it's been given to the entire world. Um, and you know, so is open source a solution? I don't know if it's a solution. It can't because hurt. it's it's out there because it's been open sourced, mm -hmm. so nobody can patent it. You could. That's one awesome way of uh, making sure that something you don't want patented to get patented. Yeah. That's all. I got tangled in myself. Um, that's that's one way of making sure that you can stop something from getting patented is just tell everyone, show everyone, publish it first. Yeah. So, well, let's get back to bad reasons why there are patents. Can you share a few that you think? Well, I mean, okay. you know, one of the easiest areas to talk about why patents are bad, actually, the first one that comes to my mind is software. It's in terms of pharmaceuticals, for example, medicines. Yeah. So one thing that could be bad is that you have a company that, through a lot of effort, through an enormous amount of money it takes to get a drug to market, uh, you know, we're talking 500 million to a billion dollars to bring a drug to market, um, people might need that drug to stay alive, or people might need that drug to have a decent quality of life. And People who need that drug might not be able to pay the enormous fees that come when one company has a monopoly on a product for a long period of time. So that's one area where, you know, it really has a big human element and a patent can, can be the difference between somebody. But isn't that extortion? Because you're, you're able to say, well, if we don't get this patent, then people will die. Mm. I don't know if it's extortion that. In the sense that um, we're, you need to threaten the patent office to get a patent, I mean, they don't, that's not their concern. Their concern is, is this is it anticipated, is it obvious? I mean, that's what the patent office is thinking about. But just from the public's perspective, or from, you know, anyone else's perspective, that's what makes me wonder, should we really be giving monopolies for certain things that are so central to our lives and so... Uh, are literally matters of life and death. That's when it starts to get a little bit harder. And, you know, there are some ways that our system has been set up to encourage people to break that type of monopoly. Um, the U.S. government actually encourages um, pharmaceutical companies, generic pharmaceutical companies, to sue um, the patent holders of these drugs. To And if they manage to defeat them in lawsuits showing that their patents are invalid, They manage to bring their drugs to market and get their own little market exclusivity period. So they get they essentially get bounties for breaking certain patents. Um, and you could actually imagine setting that up in other areas if you want to, but the only area I can think of um, in the U.S. right now is for uh, pharmaceuticals. Mm. Now, okay, pharmaceuticals is kind of the po poster uh, child uh, example. Mm -hmm. uh, there are probably worse examples than that, especially when it comes to non-tangible things, like you don't get a product, or it's just an idea, it's a process, it's a... Piece well, you can't patent an idea. Uh, you, you cannot. Just, you can't patent just an idea. You need to, it has to do something else. It's got to be useful. You've got to be able to do something with it. Um, you can patent the process, um, you know, which sounds really similar to an idea. It's just a way of doing things. It's nothing that you can point to and say, but ultimately it's something a little bit more concrete than just an idea. Mm. So, so it's supposed to be. But uh, could you, for example, uh, patent uh, a new way how to sort numbers? Because it's a process that takes some input sure. to numbers that are random. Could. And I mean, and again, to be clear, I've never done uh, software patent litigation myself personally. But I don't see any reason why you can patent a method. So, what would be the in ingredients that you would be uh, granted a patent like that? It has to be. Uh, uh, Novel, so no yep. anticipation, yep. and it has to to have some some result. So three, there are three main things that it takes for something to be patentable. It needs to be uh, useful. Mm -hmm. Rule number one: that in the U.S. system, that means basically anything, anything that's not uh, like a method for murdering as many people as possible would not be considered useful. But aside from something truly obscene, then something is useful. Mm -hmm. The next two things that needs to be one is novel. Meaning it's new, it's unanticipated. Somebody else didn't come up with it first. And three, it can't be obvious. You know, it can't be obvious to the person of ordinary skill. Mm -hmm. um, so you put those three things together and then you sort of get closer to what you can patent. You know, that's sort of, you know, in fact, it has to be able to do something. Mm -hmm. um, that's how you sort of can distinguish between a method and just mm -hmm. a concept in the air. Mm. So, um, one thing that we, we are wondering from outside the US, because I'm from Europe, mm -hmm. and so we kind of watch this from the far with mild amusement. Um, 
uh, is uh, just mild. There, there's there's certain outspoken individuals like, for example, John C. Crusoe, who uh, on one of the podcasts that he does basically said his his view is. Uh, patents should be totally abolished. And first, he had kind of a, a milder view. Okay, let's keep, if I understand correctly, let's keep pharmaceuticals, but abolish software. And now his point of view is let's abolish everything. So, what do you say to this? Is this something that that could work or, or would work, or would it be better to do some reforms, or sh should the whole thing stay as it is? Well, one thing let the market decide, because that's also the American way to let the capitalistic system decide if something is good or bad. We say that a lot, but I don't know if that's what we actually do. But um, I don't know if I'm ready to get rid of patents entirely. I mean, I don't. I think that the consequences of doing that are not really that predictable. Um, I don't really know what you would see if suddenly tomorrow nothing would happen. But what, what would happen is obviously something that companies uh, have paid money for, so they, they value that, yeah. as they see a value in these, would suddenly become worthless. So Assuming that you just abolish them today and retroactively? That, that's yeah. why they, they would they call it, it would be the, the biggest disowning since... It would be like a government taking your property away. It'd yeah, so that... Confiscating your house. That, that's one of the things that... Uh, reasons why this would never happen. But uh, what are the chances? On the other chances? hand, I mean, if you think it's something that's truly bad, I mean, if the government confiscates your slave, we don't call that something bad. We call that something good. Well, that, that's the example somebody tweeted that is the big, <laughs> biggest disowning since the freeing of the slaves. Yeah. So, uh, I, I don't think the, the United States would be ready to actually do that in, in kind of this fragile climate that we currently have. So, uh, it there's also just too much money invested right. uh, for, you know, the big companies own our government. Com so. Companies paid lots of money for, for patents, but also paid uh, for, the, for the campaigns uh, they contributed to these. So that, that's why the, the big parties in uh, the United States consider patents as a hot potato and not going to touch them. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you're going to see certain patent reforms happen. I mean, a few just happened uh, over the last two years. I and mean, to be honest, I've been out of the loop and can't even tell you about the details of them. But you're going to see them fiddling around the margins for the rest of our lives. I don't think you're going to see a scrap in the patent system mm -hmm. in our lifetime. Unless, you know, the government collapses. Mm -hmm. uh, for uh, most of the reasons you've already listed, um, is that there is so much money from such influential groups of patent holders that I just can't imagine uh, you know, Congress ignoring them. Mm. I mean, now, one thing that I'd like to uh, maybe get to as, as one of the final points um, is, can you give some advice to somebody who receives an email from one of these trolls saying, okay, your, your app has inner purchases, we have an, a patent for that, so uh, cease and desist uh, using this and pay us a license fee. What what do you think should, should would be a, a wise response to that? Because that, that, let me just say, uh, there's a, a couple of companies uh, which are secretly then striking a deal with this company, just pay the, pay the sucker and we are, we are done with it. And then there's others who, who uh, ripped out the inner purchases, like in this example, that's uh, Lotus case, if, the, if you have... have Company Lotus is uh, uh, tried to sue or is, is suing the developers who have in the purchases in their apps, and Apple stepped in and said, "Well, you have to go go through us." Mm -hmm. So, the, the question there is: uh, Is there any advice that, that you would give to somebody who suddenly finds finds a letter like that in this email? Hire a lawyer, but you can't can't afford them, aren't they? So, so expensive. Lawyers are expensive, but you can spend a few hundred bucks to get quick answer from one of them. But, you know, the question is, it depends how much it means to you. I mean, if this is something that's make or break for you, if the code that you're, you're talking about or whatever you're talking about is essential to what you're doing, to your business, to your life, if that's not worth the 300 bucks to you, then I don't know what it is. Would it, would it be smarter if you, if you do a, a, a kind of economic analysis and say, okay, paying, say, five or ten percent of your revenues to this patent troll is less money than I would lose if I disable this functionality. So it's a good thing. Okay, check. Let's just pay this. I mean, I think that
at it is, you know, it's a legal question whether you're infringing a patent, but what you do about it, if you are infringing or not infringing, that's all a business decision. So that depends on how your business works and how your revenue model works and just your personality and if you want to go through years of uh, litigation. I mean, those decisions are really difficult. You know, the law is one thing, but what you do about the law is really difficult. Yeah. But is, is there a way in between that you kind of get, get out of the heat and, and strike a deal, but then still fight the validity of this, this patent? Or is it by licensing it that you actually make it valid? You can license something and then later sue them for invalidity of the patent. You can do it. Um, you know, it's probably not the best way of doing things, but you know, why not? Yeah. All right. You can just de de delay that decision until you're ready to make it. So, uh, for instance, you know, to put it into concrete terms, you know, if you're a small new developer and you can take a cheap license for something and then you grow into a huge, huge company, um, you know, then you can rethink what has already happened and what decisions you made. Mm -hmm. So, uh, one thing that I uh, read about uh, is uh, it was just recently that software and business processes were actually able to be patentable. Isn't that, isn't that so? Didn't it? To be honest, this is not something that the, the, the not. Right? There was some su Supreme Court case. A bank was uh, uh, had a patent on a process how to distribute certain funds, and then another co uh, company sued that. I think uh, they, they thought it's invalid because that's something that they were doing also and the outcome of, of this uh, pivotal case was that okay you can uh, patent uh, business processes and then a run happened and I think many companies do that in Texas where they uh, are very likely to grant bogus patents. Uh, what do you mean about Texas? I guess I think some some state in the United States which are which is known to be granting. Lots oh, of so to clarify that, only the U.S. federal government grants patents. No individual state can grant patents. It's totally a federal thing. Mm. Um, but there are certain places in the country where people are more likely to sue each other for patent infringement because they're perceived to be good places to do it. And one of those places is the Eastern District, so Eastern District of Texas, like Walker, ah. Texas. Yeah. Um, and the only reason for that is, there are two reasons. Is one is the judges make the cases go really fast, which seems to be good for plaintiffs, people are suing for the money. Um, and they have juries that like to give out big money. Texas juries are not big money. Um, so that's just to clarify your last point. Ah, okay. um, with respect to the bigger question of um, recent uh, Supreme Court decisions on the issue. You know, I'm embarrassed to say this in, in, my, in case my colleagues or ex-colleagues see me, because I just don't remember the answer to that one. Well, that's, that's <laughs> doesn't matter, yeah. Uh, it's, it's still... Th thank you for, for the insights. It was the was a, a, a good chat we had. My pleasure. Um, uh, and, well, that, that's it for our conversation about patents. Thanks a lot.